Welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is our weekly Q&A session. If you've got any uh, tech-related questions about your mountain bike, any problems you might be having, let us know in the comments below. Use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech right down there. Alternatively, you can email us as well at hellotech at gmbn.com. And the email address is right there on the bottom of the screen for you. Okay, first up is from Jack. Hi guys, I'm just wondering how to find the correct headset size for my bike. Um, can you help me with that? Uh, yeah, there's a few things you can do. So um, you can simply measure your steerer tube with a tape measure basically, and see if it's an inch and an eighth, or if it's 1.5 or even one inch, uh, if it's a really old one. You can do that by removing the stem from your bike and you'll have access to the steerer tube. But what you do need to know is if it's a tapered steerer tube. Um, removing a fork from the bike will help with that. And you want to see if the steerer tube effectively is tapered from 1.5 to 1 and 1 8 at the top. Um, once you've done that, you will know that you will need some sort of tapered headset for the bike. Now the easy cheats way of doing this, I'm going to throw a link right on the screen now, is on Cane Creek, who make some of the finest headsets around. They have a headset finding system. Now, although they're tailoring this really for their headsets. You can use these measurements on any headset because it's an international standard way of measuring headsets. So you simply click the boxes and put your bike details in on those boxes, your frame size, your model of your bike, the year it was made, all that sort of stuff. Once you fill in all the boxes, you'll find it will give you some options of what your headset combinations might be. You might see something saying EC with a number like 44 or ZS. 44 or 56, something like that. Um, and that corresponds to the part numbers of your headset, uh, the headset you're gonna need for your bike. So you can either do that on their website and get their headsets, or you can take those numbers and you can go into a search engine like Google, for example, and look up the appropriate headset in that size that you wanna buy. Perhaps it's from Hope, perhaps it's Cane Creek if you're feeling extremely rich, or it could be a budget option. Whatever it is, those will correspond to what you need for your bike. All right, next up is from John Davis. Hi, John. Uh, great show, and I watch repeatedly for tips and advice. Well, thank you for tuning in. I uh, have mixed feedback on the wisdom of putting a 130mm travel pike fork, so that's a RockShox fork, on a hardtail stump jumper 29 alloy that was designed to take 90 to 100mm forks. Uh, it's currently running SID 100s. I just want a hardtail that's a bit more capable on Enduro type trails, but I'm told by some that I might crack, damage, or even snap my frame. I'd appreciate any help with this. I'm 100 kilos, six foot three, and I don't tend to go too easy on the trails. Probably 105 kilos with all the gear. Um, okay, John, well, firstly, uh, 130 mil is quite a lot of travel. You've got to bear in mind for every 10 mil of travel, you're changing the head angle quite, uh, almost a degree, really, you're gonna be taking off that. So your head angle on yours, if I got it right, is gonna be around 71 degrees. So you could be taking it back to 67, 68 degrees, depending on how high you go. And whilst that's not an extreme amount, you'll have a huge factor basically in how your bike handles in other areas. That's going to raise your bottom bracket quite significantly. It is going to give you slightly lazier handling um, on the steering front, which is a good thing when you're riding faster and steeper trails. Sounds like that's what you want to do. Um, but it's not going to climb very well because your seat angle is going to dramatically slacken off as well. And that really does affect your position on your bike when you're climbing. You would be able to counter this by Lowering the, adult, um, lowering the angle of your saddle and tipping it all the way forwards to try and get around that. But it's only gonna be a bit of a hack, really. Um, so for your bike with 100 mil fork, uh, probably the most I would go uh, really would be 110, absolute most 120, but I probably wouldn't even go that far. Um, your friends are right and the people you've spoken to are right. That frame really isn't designed for a longer travel fork and the type of riding that that's gonna lead you to do. More importantly, it is gonna strain the frame. You will invalidate your warranty. Um, you know, like I said, you could go up slightly in travel, like uh, 110, and you won't really mess things up too much, but I'd steer clear of going much longer than that. Right, this is a good question from Roger Nielsen. Hey gents, recently I've been watching Ask GMBN Tech, and the new funny guy made a comment that makes me want to know more. Um, yeah, I guess you could call Henry funny. Um, you guys were answering someone's question about shrinking a chain ring, and Henry mentioned a smaller ring would increase anti-squat. I want to know more. Can you guys do a video explaining how different chain rings affect suspension and kinematics versus changing cassettes at the rear with weights? Um, all right, so if you forget cassettes and that, that's not really going to affect anything. The chain ring size does, however, affect them. Right, so there is a thing called anti-squat. Um, so anti-squat is a phenomenon when you pedal effectively um, 
the compressing of the suspension is countered by the phenomenon called anti-squat. So let's just put this into layman's terms. So if you've got your chain ring and you have your pivot point, if your pivot point is above the, chain, the height of the chain ring, then you're gonna have a higher anti-squat value. If it's gonna be lower than that, you're gonna have a lower value. So a lower anti-squat value, uh, effectively when you pedal the bike, is gonna compress slightly and bob. Um, so the suspension will feel fantastic and really, really active when you are pedaling and a lot of downhill bikes will have like a low anti-squat, so it feels really plush, nice. But if you want the bike to pedal nicer, i.e. when you're pedaling, it's not gonna be compressing, you need to have a higher anti-squat value. So they raise the pivot point up and you can mess around with this with chain ring size as well to get a different effect on your bike. Um, the higher the anti-squat is, basically, and the higher the pivot point is, the higher anti-squat value is, it basically means when you pedal, the bike's gonna feel like it stands up. Now, the higher you go with the anti-squat value, the more it resists that, but, you actually lose some sensitivity on suspension action. So it's a very fine line between the two. And this is why in combination with the pivot height and the chain ring size, there's different suspension designs to offer different characteristics. Um, this is a huge, is a minefield of a subject. And actually I am working on a script at the moment to basically explain how all different suspension platforms do work and what their typical characteristics are because there is a different system out there for every type of rider really. Uh, some riders will want a simple single pivot, other riders will want something a bit more advanced like a twin link style thing like a Santa Cruz V10. And even within all of those designs you get different ones. You get ones with links that move in the same direction, you get ones with links that move in opposing directions uh, and they handle completely differently uh, again with different anti-squat values. So there you go, anti-squat essentially is a way of making a bike resist bobbing when you're pedaling. Um, the higher anti-squat value you have, the less it bobs, but the less sensitive your suspension will be. Um, that's really anti-squat for you. Um, the whole anti-squat thing has been talked about more in recent times because it's more noticeable now that we're running a single chain ring. Uh, typically in the past, a mountain bikes would have had triple chain rings. So the bigger chain ring, you'd have less anti-squat, basically, so the bike would bob. But it's not that much of an issue because the gear that you're in at that point is such a high gear that assumes that you'll be going downhill and therefore you want the suspension to feel plusher. When you're in the granny ring, however, the small chain ring, you can have a higher anti-squat. Um, so actually it was to benefit you pedal and it wants to stand up and take you up the hill a bit more. So um, it worked quite classically, but now, Suspension manufacturers can really tailor a bike around a specific chambering size for the ultimate anti-squat for the suspension platform they have. Um, you can change the way your bike handles by changing that around a bit, um, but also bear in mind by changing your uh, chambering size, you still got to pedal things as well. So you don't want to go crazy. If perhaps you've got a 30 tooth on there, you could go up to a 32 or maybe a push if you're feeling really strong up to a 34. Any more than that though, you're going to find it a struggle and it's also going to affect your suspension. Ah, Dark Joshua. Right, so this is a great question for Dark Joshua um, and one that we get asked quite a lot actually. In Dolly's bike cave, the bikes are hung vertically on the wall. Does this type of position damage the fork seals or the brakes? And then in brackets, you put air. Um, no, it's absolutely fine. If anything, it's better for the suspension, um, especially if you've got your handlebars at the top. And the reason for that is the oil that lubricates the lower legs on the forks will run all the way back up the fork and will be sit, sat around the seal. So effectively, you're helping the forks lubricate themselves. Um, so that is no problem whatsoever, however you store your bike. And it's actually quite good from time to time to flip your bike upside down, put it on the handlebars and saddle and let the oil go to where it's supposed to get. Um, as if you don't like maintaining your bike so, uh, so much. Um, as for the brakes, no. It's not a problem at all. If your brakes are bled correctly, they will have no air in the system. Air can't magically just get in by popping your bike upright. However, it can be quite beneficial actually if you have got air in your system and you wanna do a little cheeky brake bleed, put your bike up vertically over the eye with the handlebars at the top end and those air bubbles will rise up to the, the cylinders in the lever, basically up to the reservoir there, and you can actually take the cap off and you can basically let that air out without even really having to bleed, and you can uh, top up the fluid there while you're at it. So it's just a little cheeky way of helping get air out of the system that's in there already. Um, so no, it's absolutely fine to store your bike like that. Uh, Justin Locke. Hi gents, I have a really terrible set of dirt jump forks. They're RST Dirt 100 millimeter coil sprung with preload adjustments only. They're incredibly heavy, over three kilos. Yeah, that is ridiculously heavy. Shall I make the best of what I have or spend a minimal amount, let's say 90 quid, on a pair of 800 gram rigid forks? I only ride Urban Street and Park at the moment. Uh, loving the channel, Justin Locke. Um, to be honest, mate, there's not a lot you can do with them. Um, 
budget Dirt Jam forks are notoriously heavy. They overbuild them for a reason because you're going to treat them quite badly with that style of riding, especially if you're doing like fakies, jumping off flights of stairs, all that sort of stuff. Um, to be honest, I wouldn't bother buying a pair of 90 quid rigid forks. I would, if you can spend any money, save up longer uh, and buy yourself a pair of dedicated dirt jump forks like a Manitou Circus. You can pick those up for about 350 quid, which agreed, it does sound like a lot of money compared to the 90 quid you were going to spend. But trust me, you don't want to just switch to a rigid fork. Put up your fork for the time being and put those pennies away in the bank. Save up and get yourself a proper fork. You will not regret it. Next starts from Sean Wilson. Hi Doddy, wondering if you knew if it's possible to find a solid full suspension mountain bike in the $1,200 to $1,600 range. Um, I've recently been looking at the Ghost Kato FS 3.7. Have you any other ideas? Um, all right, so I'm going to talk about this in pound sterling because they're fairly similar, unfortunately, for us at the moment to the US dollar uh, and in fact the euro. Um, so let's just call it a single price for the time being. All right, so you've got a few options. Um, the first one I'm going to throw to is the Marin Hawk Hill one on your screen right now. Uh, 1,350, so it's bang on in your price range. It's got 27 and a half inch wheels, 120 mil travel out back, 130 mil fork up front. It's a fantastic little bike. Um, it's well worth upgrading in future. It's a really decent frame, handles really well. It's nice and stiff, very active suspension on there. Definitely worth upgrading in the future so you can grow with that bike. Over time, you can put a perhaps a better shock on it or some lighter wheels or whatever you fancy. Uh, definitely worth looking at those and you can get them all over the world. Uh, next one on the screen is a Caliber Boss Nut. Um, check it out, we often refer to them here on GMBN Tech. Um, they retail for 1,500, although if you have the discount card, you can get them for 1,100. And um, the discount card is free. I'm not really sure how it works, but it's totally free and you get a whopping discount there. Uh, that's 130 mil travel front and rear, um, 27 and a half inch wheels. Um, and there's also the triple B version of that. So it's a slightly older frame, but it's a better spec. Uh, that's 1,399 uh, with the discount card. Um, Again, it's 130 mil travel, it's a bit beefed up, it's got dropper post and a few other things on it. Uh, Caliber bikes, if they will ship them to where you are, are definitely worth looking at. Uh, finally, uh, Canyon Neuron. Um, I've got a Neuron, they make them in carbon and alloy. It's 130 mil. They're available, I think, in the smaller sizes with little 27 and a half inch wheels and the bigger sizes with 29 inch wheels. Uh, handles really well, it's an agile frame to ride. You can get them from 1,449 and it's Canyon, so they'll ship them anywhere and you'll get a really good bike for the money. Uh, so there you go, there's a few options for you. Good luck. Okay, next up's from Dethrone ME. Hi guys, any suggestions on full face helmets that allow me to use glasses, um, as in like spectacles I guess. Uh, cheers. Um, well, technically any full face helmet that fits you correctly does allow for that. Um, although some helmets are going to fit tighter and more securely on the head. So perhaps you want to look at something a bit more focused towards enduro racing. So the more ventilated options, because uh, the racers do tend to switch between goggles and glasses depending on how much pedaling they've got to do. Um, so check out the Fox Pro Frame. This is one on screen right now. Um, fantastic helmet, is fully certified, super light, loads of ventilation in it, and it's got the all important jaw guard on there that it sounds like you're looking for, and you can wear those with glasses, no problem. Um, Pock Air Spin, definitely worth a look, perhaps on the more downhill orientated side of things. Uh, Giro Switchblade, that's the one with the removable jaw guard. Um, that fits more like a trailer type helmet, so you can fit glasses in that one as well. Um, and also the Troy Lee Stages helmet, so that's definitely worth a look as well. Um, this is it on the screen. Right, next up's from Florian Shasner. Hi guys, I'm currently running a Magura MT5. Yep, fantastic break that. Uh, I'm absolutely satisfied with the performance, but the levers don't feel the way I want them to feel. Um, they're perfectly bled. Um, and now I'm thinking of converting them to a Shigura, yeah, so uh, Shimano Saint levers, or to MT7 levers for more adjustments to my preferences. Um, what would you recommend? Well, firstly, um, I would stay within Magura. I would, if I was gonna change the levers at all, I'd definitely go for the MT7s. Uh, they're fantastic brakes, they really are. They're immensely powerful. Um, although some people do seem to think they're too powerful, um, which I find funny, but um, I quite like that. You can never have too much braking power. Uh, did you know though, with Maguras, you can actually change the lever blades. They've got a whole system of different lever blade options out there. So I've got the MT Trails. Uh, that's the one you've got a four pot on the front and a regular two pot on the rear. 
And I've changed my lever blades for the Danny McCaskill edition lever blade, which is a one finger lever. It's very small, it's very stiff, and it just feels fantastic. And um, so before upgrading your whole lever, perhaps consider looking at some of the lever blade options. Uh, I made a video about customizing your brakes and I use those as an example. So that's gonna be in the description below and playing over the top of me talking to you right now, hopefully should be some cool images of those different style lever blades, uh, including these cool ones, uh, the Loic Bruni downhill lever blade, also very nice. Oh, well, there we go. There's our uh, Ask GMBN Tech in the bag. Uh, if you've got any questions for us for the next show, get them in, in the comments. And don't forget to use that hashtag, Ask GMBN Tech. For a couple more videos, click down here to see a shock service real time. So that's Henry literally just stripping down, doing a basic air can service uh, in front of you. So you can actually follow that at home. So it's a really simple process. Don't be scared of doing that. And click down here for learning everything about ground anchors and how to install them. Uh, I strongly suggest that you get one if you've not got one because it does help keep your bike safe. Uh, as always, don't forget to click subscribe, share our stuff around and click that little not notification bell. And that means you'll get a little bell, a little alert will come up on your phone or on your device every time we launch a new video. Cheers guys.